This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 391, Building Your Career. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about building your career with Mike Anello. Mike, please update with bio info as you see fit. First of all, you guys must be sick of me by now, right? I mean, I'm on, I'm, I'm on, I'm on. I feel like I'm on fairly often. Uh, but anyway, hey, I'm Mike. Um, I've been in the Drupal community for more than 15 years. Let's just say that I'm a Drupal developer oh. and trainer. Okay, that's the first time we've had a, a guest introduce themselves. Usually, I read something, but uh, oh, I, well, could, I felt like it that, was a prompt at that point. That could be a uh, that could be a that could be a new thing we do here. Um, like it is, Sorry. it is always a pleasure to have you on the show, and um, as always, thank you for joining us again. I'm John Picozzi, Solutions Architect at EPAM, and today my co-hosts are Nick Laughlin, founder of Enlightened Development. Hi, Nick. Hello. Hello. Uh, looking forward to recording the show and then going out and shoveling about 12 inches of snow. So it's going to so, be, be a good night. Let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, Nick and I are getting the same nor'easter right now, but um, my nor'easter has been all rain and his seems like it has not. No, I've got eight, like 10 or 12 inches outside right now. That's awesome. Sure. I would I would love to have that much snow. Uh, here in uh, southern Rhode Island, literally our winter has consisted of, in total, maybe five inches of snow, and not even, not even all at once. So, um, anyway, we can move on uh, to uh, our guest host, Jacob Brockowitz, a module maintainer at the Big Blue House. Jacob's the maintainer of many Drupal modules, including Webform and the schema.org blueprints module for Drupal. Um, Jacob, before we continue, I want to say uh, this is your your last week with us here. And um, thank you for joining us for the last uh, four weeks. This has been great. It's been so easy going. It's been kind of a nice highlight to my day just to record these. And even at the end of today, it's a nice time to just kind of wind down on a Tuesday. Um, in New York, we're getting no snow. It's like a sprinkle. We've maybe gotten an inch total. There was a point where we went the longest run without snow in the city, um, except oh, wow. they are closing bridges. Like the GW has closed the top because it's so windy. Hmm. They're concerned that trucks are going to fly off the, the side of the bridge, even though I've never heard of that happening. But um, yeah, looking forward to this topic. It's really near and dear to me, our careers. I mean, all of us, we all work in the community. Okay, so yeah. let's keep going. It is it is going to be a uh, it is going to be a great topic. But before we get to that, um, let's bring in Martin Anderson Klutz, a senior solutions engineer at Acquia and maintainer of a number of modules of his own to tell us about the module of the week. Martin, what do you have for us this week? Thanks, John. I thought this week we would talk about a module that actually I find tremendously useful in my own community contributions, which is Devel Debug Log, which allows developers to inspect the contents of variables. And if those are classes, you can also do things like dig into nested properties and all of the methods that are available. So it's a module that was created in August of 2011. It currently has 2.0.1 and 8.x-1.2 versions available, both released earlier this year to be ready for Drupal 10. As seen multiple releases in, in recent months, particularly uh, those last two that we talked about, um, actually has very few um, issues open for the uh, number of sites that are using it, which is currently 2,267. Although, uh, in truth, about two-thirds of those are actually using the D7 version. So the, uh, the de Devel Debug uh, module differs from some of the other solutions that, that people might use in this space in the sense of sort of the standard Devel module or even XDebug in the sense that it actually pushes the output into more of a log. So similar to Watchdog, that is saved until you actually clear the log. And, and so that allows you to keep that as a reference while you continue to work on a certain piece of code. It does rely on the Devel module to create that formatted debugging output, as well as the Devel Kint Extras module to sort of get all of those extra methods for your classes. And uh, 
I'll just point out here that although some of the modern Drupal development tooling has made it easier than ever to set up Xdebug, so you know, think about like DDEV or Lando or even Cloud IDEs, um, to me, devel debug log is just a very fast and easy to set up and can be sort of a useful addition to a developer's debugging tool set. So maybe we'll open up to some discussion. Does anybody else use devel debug log or you know, what are some of the other tools that everybody's using these days for debugging? I actually have a question to start because you you ha said the usage statistics, you know, 2,267 sites are using it. Two out of three of them appear to be Drupal 7. Um, and maybe you guys can educate me as to like, this is like a non-production module, right? So like should probably be used in like dev local instances. So like, is that usage stat saying like people are just not shutting it off and using it in production or are there locals and development sites phoning home and, and providing those the, stats? The, the local dev sites. So when you install yeah, yeah, like okay. standard install, the update module, I think the update module is enabled on the standard install. Yep. And that's the scenario. People are just like, got it. Got it. Okay. Cause I was shocked I, that that many sites would be using this and like reporting back because you know, it I, I also like wouldn't be surprised. Anyway. I also wouldn't be surprised that people are just leaving it on production. <laughs> too. Sad. I mean, I mean, I mean, people do. I mean, yeah. I, I don't. And and config split makes it really easy to disable that kind of thing. But people do leave stuff like that on production all yeah. the time. I was going to go into, I, I don't know about this module, but I use Deb uh, Devel's DPM and DSM. And those are maybe the old DSM, I think is the old one, to just display things on screen. I'm I'm one of those old school that... I find that a lot faster than X debug sometimes um, to just capture something and move on. And the problem I run with X debug is the performance hit you could take. If you're running a lot of automated tests, it can be really frustrating. Hmm. Um, I'm old. Like I just started out using JavaScript before there were any debugging tools. So I got used to printing messages a lot. Like that was the only way you could do it. Yeah. I, I actually, I mentioned this to Martin when he mentioned that this uh, was going to be the module of the week this week. It, I stopped using Devel maybe about a year ago. Uh, when, when I think when when I switched to DDEV, it made Xdebug just so much easier that I switched to using that. If I need to display something really quick and I don't feel like turning on Xdebug, I'll just do a print R. Um, and if I need to, if I'm doing something where I need to like look at something more than once, right, and it's not like just a simple flat value, then I just turn on Xdebug. Um, but Develop. I mean, I use it for years and years and years. Yeah, to me, the the big advantage that this module has over sort of standard Devel is if you're troubleshooting something that fires kind of asynchronously. That sometimes um, that can be tricky to get on screen. Whereas this thing, you get it in the log, and you can just go in and sort of debug the value. Ooh, that sounds That's really valuable. Yeah. The the thing the thing that I ran into with Devel that started making it less helpful for me, and that it might just be a settings thing, to be honest, is that. Um, once Kint was split out, I found that like limiting the levels didn't always work. And so it just would fail to load. I just get white screens all the time or a page would just take forever to load because it's loading a class that has, you know, 10,000 methods on it or something. And it just, you know, just became a little less useful, but getting that into the logs might be useful enough that it's <laughs> worth picking back up just for this. So on that note, there is kind of a snippet you can put into your settings.php to sort of limit the the max kint depth to to four or yeah. five or whatever you need, which yeah, can definitely help to re reduce those kinds of white screen errors. Awesome. Well, Martin, as always, thanks for a great module and on to our primary topic. So we are talking about building your career um, as we are all uh, in the Drupal community and have built um, rather illustrious Drupal careers, I, I think. Um, I was actually interested in starting off this show with less of a question and more of a uh, show and tell, if you will, um, and just quickly going around the uh, the group here and um Wondering if you can share with us uh, an abridged version, if possible, uh, story about how you got started with Drupal. Um, Jacob, I am going to ask you to actually go first, if you don't mind. So 
I, I like to say it's like I have the old school path to Drupal, which is I built a custom CMS 20 plus years ago. It was around for 10 years. It got very old. It was written in, it's funny, ASP and J script, very, very old school. And oh. it was really showing its wear. And I realized you had to, I had to move on to something better. And I kind of open source was picking up a lot of traction. And I was like, we need to move to an open source CMS. Did the comparison of Drupal, WordPress, Joomla, concluded that Drupal had more legs on it, more for a large scale site, and just started diving into Drupal for a Drupal 6 site. And then gradually my role in Drupal has shifted. You know, I just was a consumer of Drupal back then, just used Drupal 6, didn't contribute a lot of, didn't contribute any code. I tried one or two modules. And then when we moved from Drupal 6 to 8, that was when I started getting more. We had to because we moved early. So we had to migrate some contrib modules from Drupal 7 to 8. And I got more and more involved in the community. So went from custom CMS to Drupal and haven't left since. And decided that it's much easier than writing everything custom to use Drupal. <laughs> I used RSS as the example. I wrote a custom RSS reader and oh, wow. aggregator and syndicator and i was like this is stupid this is a waste of time <laughs> okay so mike so, you go next yeah you know mine is is not completely dissimilar from jacob's um similar time frames um except where he wrote one custom cms i wrote about 10 of them for various <laughs> clients um not really thinking about the fact that I could reuse stuff. And and each time they came, you know, it became more complex. I remember I, I actually wrote one for a client where I would actually regenerate a static homepage. You know, that's a kind of a, you know, a, a, an initial shot at caching things, right? I would just yeah. be like a static site generator, but it would be coming from, from content from the database. And it took me a few years um, to realize that that was stupid. And to kind of uh, start looking around, and and I, I got my start with you know ASP ASP.NET Cold Fusion, made my way to PHP, um, and then I dabbled in WordPress and Zoops and OS Commerce and some other ones, and eventually found Drupal and found the community and uh, really started digging into the code and, and enjoyed the the elegance of, of the Drupal code even back in like 4.6 4.7 days and. Mike, I actually learned something at Florida Drupal Camp about you that, um, and correct me because I think I'm going to botch this, but uh, you got your start uh, in in engineering, right? You were correct, you were not yeah. you were not building websites at the at the onset. Yeah, my uh, my degrees. I have a bachelor's in aerospace engineering and a master's in mechanical engineering. So, all right, um, but it was, you know. My my master's was uh, on heat and energy transfer, so it was all very theoretical, and that led to me building models, computer models of heat and energy transfer. So I mm -hmm. so you know I, I I've been in software for a long time, yeah. and um, you know I worked as an engineer as a research scientist for eight years, uh, writing software, leading a couple software projects. And that was around the time that Mosaic was coming out and the web was formed. And um, I just happened to have some free time at my job to dabble in that stuff and kind of saw that as a, as a way to not have to sit in a cubicle 40 hours a week. There you go. Nick Lathlam, what about you? It feels like a job interview. I'm a little nervous. But, um, well, unlike Jacob and Mike, I did not write my own CMS. Um ever. However, like Mike, I was actually an engineer first. I am, I don't know if people know this, I might have said it on the show at some point, but I was a plastics engineer. And I graduated in 2008, which was <laughs> the last time banks were failing. And there was a huge recession. And uh, I decided to go back to school to continue my education. And on the side, my cousin was doing some web stuff. And so I asked him if he had any work for me on the side while I was putting myself through college. And he said, sure, uh, there's this thing we use called Drupal. <laughs> and I remember him telling me, it's good for login stuff, but it's not great for everything. So you want to build your site and then you put Drupal in the subdirectory and let Drupal only control the parts of your site that you need clients to update. And it took me 
maybe six months to realize the folly of that and that Drupal should control more of the site. But um, haven't looked back. It's been 15 years, maybe two or three years into it. I realized that I could continue going back to school and have similar job prospects or I could focus on the business that was already starting to thrive. And I've been working with Drupal since Drupal five days. That's awesome. Um, so how about you? Uh, let's see. I, I graduated with a degree in um, internet commerce and, you know, basically the, the internet uh, e-commerce and web management and that sort of thing. And um, my first job out of college, I was working for a small startup and we were building, um, we needed to build this, this, I remember it was like a domain reselling website and we, and we were building it with like PHP. And then my boss came in and was like, Hey, uh, Joomla, we want to use, like somebody wants to use Joomla. And I'm like, okay, let me see if I can figure, figure that one out. Um, and, um, I, I, that job was short lived. Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly why, but it was short lived. Um, and then I went to work for an agency in, in Providence and I'm like sitting at my desk and they're like, so like, have you done anything with the CMS? And I'm like, ah, my last job, I did a little bit with like Joomla. It was kind of weird, but, um, they're like, well, we use Drupal here. And I'm like, okay. And, uh, I'm like, all right, let me, uh, let me, let me learn about that. And they're like, here's a I think at that point it was like or late four, early five. And they're like, here's a Drupal site, go build it. And I'm like, uh, okay, cool. So it was very much, um, it was very much sink or swim, uh, for me. Um, clearly, uh, I decided to swim and, uh, uh now I'm here with all you lovely folks. So, uh, I like to think it, I like to think it worked out. Absolutely. So, so let's take a moment to talk about some of the different types of careers in Drupal. Um, cause there's, there's a bunch of them. Um, you know, there's, they range from, maybe I'll talk about this first one, the sole practitioner, since that's kind of what I am. Um, you know, you can kind of be, <coughs> and there's even a bunch of different levels there, but I consider myself, a am a sole proprietor. It's an LLC. Um, I specialize in, you know, architecting sites and kind of helping people with bandwidth issues, right. Or specialty issues. So if somebody has, uh, if my client, if a client has like a really complex problem that their internal team can't solve, or they don't want to dedicate the resources to, um, I'll sometimes come in for that. Or if an agency has a couple of big projects coming in at once and they just need some bandwidth, they don't really want to hire somebody full time, or they're trying to hire some people starting their career. And looking for some of that and they just need somebody to ramp up during the alter that kind of thing um but you can also be a sole practitioner on the front end what are, what are the kinds of opportunities are there out there in the drupal world you know I, I think that you know these days you're seeing fewer and fewer people who are coming in to drupal to be you know a sole practitioner um i think a lot of folks that that you know we see um, are folks coming in who are looking for a full-time Drupal job, you know, with an agency, with an organization that has their own Drupal site. Um, we also see a lot of folks who are Drupal adjacent, um, more often than not, like on the, on the Drupal content management side of things, who want to take a bigger role in their Drupal site. So that's kind of another uh, input path. Um, we don't often see... And by we, I'm talking about Drupal Easy. We don't often see folks come in who are specifically saying, I want to work on Drupal government sites, or I want to work on nonprofits, or I want to work in a, in a particular industry. Um, more often than not, it's, you know, I'm looking for something for 20 hours a week. I'm looking for something full time. Um, I know a little bit about Drupal from this experience I have. I want to learn more. Um, or I know Drupal pretty well, but I want to learn how to be a back-end Drupal developer. So uh, I think the majority of the folks that are come in are um, have some level of previous knowledge with Drupal and just kind of want to grow into a larger role. And are you saying but full-time Drupal, like I am a Drupal developer, or that's part of their resume as a concrete step to say, like, uh, this is my expert, like expertise. Be. Yeah, that they're yeah that they're wanted to grow into. Yes, mm. absolutely. 
Um, you know, we have we have in our beginner class, we tend to have, I would say, maybe on average 30 to 40 percent career switchers. So folks who are not involved in a Drupal career, maybe they're involved in a technical career, maybe not. Um, but they want to they want to switch careers and they want to learn Drupal. And Mike, I'm wondering, so, you know, we're talking about kind of like career opportunities you know, within the community and like kind of where those those sit. Right. And like you see a lot with like NGOs, government organizations, you know, large companies, small companies. Um, I'm wondering when you see a like a career switcher. Right. Are they usually switching within the same like vertical that they they have worked in or are they kind of like, I'm done with this. I want something new. And that's like, that's going to be Drupal. Yeah. Maybe 50, 50. Right. You know, we definitely have folks from some, uh, from other areas of tech that just want to get involved in Drupal, but we, we definitely have folks who are just coming from a completely different, you know, way of life career and, and moving into Drupal. Yeah, I can and you know that's that that's not an easy thing. I mean, we're very yeah. straightforward. We're very honest w- with folks, and um, you know, for our beginner class, I interview everyone prior to acceptance, and just kind of I want to set expectations, so I don't want them to, you know, spend money on our class if they're not aware of what they're fully getting into and the level of effort that's going to be required. And it also helps me, you know, these interviews also help me gauge, you know, is this, you know. You know, for lack of a, a you know of oversimplifying, is this person a nerd like the rest of us? Right? Yeah. Do they have a passion for technology, hmm. um, or are they just trying to check a box to get a Drupal job? Yeah, that's a big difference between developers: the ones that do it for a paycheck and the ones that do it because they love it. I mean, I had a friend who's like a lifelong programmer; who, that was his whole thing. And they're yeah. they're both and they're both legitimate. Um, it's you fair to want it. a paycheck. Um, well, yep. you got to love it to really excel in it. And, and in this community, it helps to love it. If you're doing it for your job, you can just do it. Um, I was going to say I was going to own something because I realized this. We all three went around. And my background, I have a BFA. <laughs> I have a bachelor's in fine arts. I learned how to paint. Oh, really? Yes. And I think it's important. Huh. I feel like that's important for me to own that because there's a certain point where you don't have to be in tech to get into tech. You don't have to have that degree. But I will say I worked really hard. Like that first job I got I spent six months in the basement of my folks house after starving from graduating and just read books and taught myself programming and even when I switched to Drupal I mean my pathway was being self-taught and I don't my, you know my, my it's like I training wasn't even an option back 20 years ago it was but it wasn't the way it is now where you could collectively get online you'd have to go sign up for a class and instead I read books and now I, I think that's less and less um and I, I did it because I, I needed a career. I needed a way to pay the bills. Um, mm. But I love it. And that's a different, you know, or I always liked it when I started because it's a challenge. Um, yeah, that's some people definitely, you know, some people still to this day, they learn best on their own, right? Everybody learns differently. Mm-hmm. So, but there are definitely folks who, you know, who we train because they need a structured environment to learn. You know, I learned the same way. I read everything I could. I still have you know books back here from I, Drupal, yeah. four, five, six, seven days. You know that that I I devoured and went mm-hmm. to every meetup I could. Start you know I was one of the founders of the uh, the Florida Drupal meetup just so I could get more knowledge so I can you know quicken my transition from a mechanical engineer to a full time you know web developer. You know I'm gonna I'm gonna digress for one second because you brought up this and i think we could agree that everyone learns differently but i can give some insight on what i've learned is you can learn differently but it is important to embrace having a mentor or a community in the software world like that's in difference oh, like yeah. yeah i just i just like it's a life lesson i kind of clicked and it took me a long well, time i had bad mentors starting out i want to emphasize that i had people that made fun of me for making a coding mistake which i've never done in my that's career to love, anyone Jacob. that's just tough i love. know but then you start to realize that it's very important to have mentors and be open to it, to people that you look up to, you know, even if you never meet the person, but online to find right. those people where you're like, I want to see what they're doing. The yeah, phrase that... I use all the time is when... that mentors and the Drupal community will accelerate your path. You could still get to the same point in a career 
you know, without mentors, mm-hmm. without, you know, embracing the community, it's just going to take you or it's going to take the vast majority of people a heck of a lot longer. Yeah. Right. You want to achieve a goal in the Drupal community faster? Go with people. I think that's one of the things that's really good about the Drupal community too, is that you can, uh, speaking of this, I need to update mine because I just realized that mine is not updated. But if you go to somebody's profile page, you can see who their mentors are, right? And so you can recognize that. And, and you're you're right, Mike and, and Jacob. I mean, men, the first maybe two years of my Drupal career, everything I did, I did on my own. I didn't know that there was a Drupal community per se like i knew about irc and people helped me there certainly mentored me there but like i didn't know that aku was just around the corner i didn't know that there's a providence drupal meetup a boston drupal meetup like <laughs> i didn't know there was a western mass drupal camp right i didn't know any of that and it wasn't until until i found that out and found some mentors there and started going there that i really that i really started picking up all the gap like finding it was two things one was i realized here's the stuff i'm missing and who i can ask to help with that kind of stuff, but also even things like telling me like, oh, you are doing this the right way rather than just always wondering or like double checking something because you're not sure you did it right. Just have a mentor to be like, no, no, you, you did that right. You don't have to check that 50 times. Like it, it's stable, right? Once you set that up, it's fine. Um, That's and, one of and- the things our, our beginner class offers is we, we provide every student with a community mentor. And hmm. we are so lucky. We have got some great great Drupal community members as our mentors. And often, like even this semester, we have more mentors than we need because we have people who kind of know the program and um, who want to be involved. And it's we're, we're super lucky that way. It's important. So uh, well, like we had this, there's this question here, which is going to, I think the mentor discussion is incredibly important because it's, it's about getting people into the community. But it's something I, I put this question in because I thought it was important that we just define the roles in our community because people are talking about like getting people in and we are very developer centric because we're all developers. Mike, you're a trainer. So I think that's one of the roles, but could we just, just walk through what we feel like are the broad roles in this community when people are thinking about entering it? I mean, let's just establish, we said developer and with decoupling, we could even say backend developer. Um, Mike, what would be your list of roles? I mean, we have one here that we're, we're, yeah. we're all typing them uh, out. <laughs> yeah. I would start with site builder. Like I, I, I think anybody who, you know, is going to do virtually every other role is dependent on the site builder. So site builder role some at some level, um, whether you are a sysadmin or a program manager, project manager, clearly front and back end developers, you, you know, everyone needs to have kind of that base level site building knowledge, understanding Drupal information's architecture, understanding how to implement, you know, entities and fields and really and, and reference fields and, and and stuff like that. So that's kind of the the the, the price of admission, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, you know, I kind of put it into three big groups and that's front end, back end, and everything else. <laughs> you know, the vast majority of folks who come through our course um, you know, uh, fall into one of those three groups. You know, front end, back end, or something else being you know, maybe a content administrator who maybe the you know, content administrator plus, right? So that's yeah. a content administrator who maybe does some view stuff and meta tag stuff and some other things. Um, you know, project manager. You know, project managers need to have like a certain level of Drupal knowledge because in most of the time they are acting as a universal translator between the client and the developers. Um, so yeah. we have plenty of project managers who come through our class. They're not, you know, they're never going to use Git. They just want to be able to have a conversation with developers and translate, you know, between clients and stakeholders and developers. I mean, I think um, it's, I yeah. think it's important here, right. To, you know, as somebody who is, has talked to DrupalCon about non-code contribution, right. Like there are a lot of roles that don't necessarily involve touching code. And I think Mike highlighted a few of them there, right. Like site builders, project managers. Um, but I also think like, this list is definitely not exhaustive, right? If you're listening to this right now and you're like, "Ah, it doesn't look like the Drupal community has anything for me because I'm the sales guy. Like that is not the case. You know, I think people listening to this should probably get from it that 
the Drupal community is not just a bunch of developers. There's a wide range of job types out there and roles that need to be filled, right? Um, and companies have those roles too. Like, I mean, any company that is working with Drupal has the need for a sales guy that can speak Drupal, right? Because that that enables you to do your job better. Um, coming from- Developer uh, workflows this is another one. Yep coming from somebody who used to used to be an account manager, right? Like an account manager with Drupal expertise is a super powerful thing, right? So like, you know, going down this list again, not exhaustive, like, uh, you know, I'm a solution architect, right? I do not, I do not develop code every day. I do not site build every day, but I, you know, I still have a very healthy understanding of Drupal and how it works and how it integrates with other systems. Um, you know, Jacob is a, uh, you know, a contrib maintainer, right? So like, that's a, that's a pretty, um, pretty important role, but you know, I, I don't know. That's not necessarily, um, your, your day to day, but it's something that you're doing and, you know, is a, is a role within the community that helps empower you to be able to do, to do your day to day. Um, you know, so I think we want to make sure we're being very, um, you know, whoever's listening is not thinking like, oh, this is a very specific list. These are the these are the only things possible. The possibilities are are endless, I think. Yeah, it, basically, whichever role you have, like if you're a project manager, you can specialize in Drupal and have Drupal knowledge, right? And and that can just all that does is provide value to your employer and to your career because you I mean, can some of the best project managers I've worked with are very familiar with, with how Drupal works and they can kind of speak the lingo of like, Oh, well, that's actually a block. That's not a, and that's, you know, yeah. the permissions on that block might not be right. And that's probably why you're having that problem, which, you know, your, your dev team like definitely appreciates that the heck out of that because that's one less, one less issue that they're going to have to yeah. kind of dig into and troubleshoot. Right. Yeah. I, John, you're making the point. It's like to understand the roles in the Drupal community. For me, I was just brainstorming on like, where do you give someone good guidance? I'll throw out, if you went to a DrupalCon and looked at all the sessions and read through them, you would get a what's what of the Drupal community because every one of these roles we just talked about has sessions on it. How to manage a Drupal project, how to do core contribution, how to maintain, you know, people talking about their modules and then people talk about front end, back end. And then you have just sysadmins talking about how they manage an, a large Drupal infrastructure. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a vast amount of roles and everyone's willing to talk about it. I kind of love that. There's no secret role in the Drupal community. Yes. They're all public and everyone, like no one has a secret role. Like I'm that special agent in yeah. the Drupal community that does this. It's, it's all very transparent and people are always sharing what they're doing. Even, yeah, even if it's not technical there, I organize events. What's that? How do I do that? Yeah. How do I hurt cats? Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. we have to be careful though. To you might, you know, we might want to differentiate between like paid roles and volunteer roles. Sure. I, I think it's very difficult to get a paid Drupal event organizer role. I don't even know if any actually exist. But you know, so there's that kind of like community roles, yeah. and then there's job roles. Well, right. the Drupal Association and the people setting up DrupalCon and stuff. I'm sure they're you know paid for their services so there, there's some there might not be a whole lot but right Fair. one of one of the things i think i'd like to point out too before we move on is even within these individual roles that we're talking about there's a wide variety of types right if you so for example a back-end architect or a back-end developer rather you could be a sole proprietor like me where you're seeing every the whole life cycle of websites a few times a year. You could work for an agency that may be a large agency that works on many, many, many different sites a year. Maybe you work for an organization that just has an enormous Drupal infrastructure and it has 50 developers and you're just working on one small part of it, right? So there's, or, or maybe you work for an organization that has a lot of Drupal sites, like a, a university and your, your job within that Drupal organization is making sure their caching is handled properly or something, right? So you can you can be very narrowly focused, very broad. Like there's a wide variety of types of roles that you do, even if you're one specific um, role or another too. So, I know we want to, oh, John, do you mind ahead. if I, John? No, uh, go for it. Uh, 
Mike said something about like unpaid roles, and I think it's really a good one to talk about for one second, like event organizer. What's interesting yeah. about unpaid roles in the community is those can still help your paid careers. Like an example Excellent. would be someone's like, I'm trapped as a developer and I want to show that I can be a project manager. And they go out and organize an event, which shows a much higher level of organization. It gets them out of their norm. It's an amazing thing on their resume. These un like the there's these roles that are like yeah, they're unpaid but huge opportunities for your career because then you can take that back. And, it's interesting. You know, yeah. It's interesting, Jacob, because my my talk about non-code contribution goes into that, how like you 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 could be doing one thing, right? As your your example, right? I'm a developer, I want to get into like project management or I want to get into some, you know, marketing or for, you know, for something. And like those non-code contributions and those kind of community event or community contributions, right? That are not technically not paid, right? Like uh, organizing events are a great, um, a great, uh, way to get insight into other people's other people's jobs and to try to do something that's outside of outside of your day-to-day -day. i mean you know I, I think all of us or at least three-fourths of us um don't organize events for our day-to-day -day, right but we are involved in in certain certain camps and, and events that happen um throughout the year right um and you know i think that definitely can help elevate your, your, your personal, um, your personal profile and, and, you know, maybe, maybe not help you in your job right now, but maybe help you get the next job or help you get a raise or a, uh, a, a, um, a position, uh, an advancement in your, at your current, uh, in your current situation. So yeah. And that is a great point. And, and, and one of the great things about the Drupal, the Drupal community about this is that it's one thing to be like, I worked at this place. I did this thing when you're applying for another, a job. It's another thing to be able to say, here's my Drupal profile. And it shows the credit that I have working on these core issues or this event or this contrib module, right? You can I, see the issue credits directly on the profile. I cannot page. agree with you more, Nick. Any interview, every time I interview somebody, I'm like, hey, can I see your Drupal.org profile? And it's either one of two ways. Like, yeah, sure. Here it is. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty impressive. Or it's like, well, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff and I can't really share it with the community. Okay, I understand that. But like, there's also not a, not a whole ton of extra stuff there. And I'm kind of like, oh, all right, there's a little bit of, little bit of insight there. So I think you are, uh, you're spot on with, uh, with that. So the next two questions kind of talk about um, taking those first steps and, and they, they di diverge a little bit, right? So the question I'm about to ask, and Mike, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, point this question at you because you're, you're our resident expert here. You know, when you're first stepping into starting a career, right, you're fresh out of college, what are kind of those first steps that that you should take to kind of get in, get, you know, get that train moving um, specifically after college? Yeah. So after college, knowing Drupal or after college, not knowing Drupal or just in general? Well, do, well, do, do colleges teach Drupal? I guess that's the question. Uh, I, I know of a couple that have Drupal as part of their web development curriculum. Okay. Not a dedicated Drupal class, but it's like one of the topics in some web development classes. Okay. And they might have right. WordPress um, too. I've seen that yep. more often, yeah. which is fine. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put some guardrails on the question a little bit. Otherwise it's just too wide open for me to have anything intelligent to say about it. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, if you are, you know, new in the job market and you have some exposure to Drupal and you know, or you have a strong indication or you, you know, you have a passion for, I want to be a Drupal developer. Like, what should you do first? I mean, this is not going to be any surprise, but um, if you have zero experience, you need to, I, I would say, find a project in the community to get involved with. Find a mentor. And just start doing something that when you do start interviewing, you can point to and say, oh, I have experience on this thing over there. And I worked with these three people. Right. And all that yeah. stuff should be surfaced, as Nick was saying, on your Drupal.org profile as well. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot more that, in my opinion, 
you know, for a young Drupal developer, if, if I see, if I have someone new to our class who has never had a Drupal job, but then I go to their Drupal.org profile and I see that, you know, they've been active with documentation updates or, you know, code commits or whatever, that says a heck of a lot, right? That means here's someone who has not made a dime from Drupal and yet they're contributing. Yeah. So that shows passion. And, and I think that goes a long way um, because those volu- that volunteer experience can very easily turn into paid experience. And it's not something that you have to wait until after graduation, right? Like you could, as a sophomore or a junior or even a freshman, you could start jumping into the Drupal community if that's something you're interested in and, and start showing that involvement and, um, you know, yeah. working towards building that kind of profile and that, that, that yeah. credit, if you will. And I get I, it. It's I, tough if, if like you don't know anybody in the community. Like where do you even start with that? Where do you go? Yeah, I mean, oh, well, oh, pick me. So you pick need me. like an entry point. You need okay, you, you go. You should go. You should go to a Drupal event. Yeah. <laughs> Again, if it, you're brand new, do you even know the Drupal events exist? Do you, you know, you, like, as someone brand new, you don't know. Like, is Drupal event going to be like this insiders thing? That's you know, they're going to look at me like I'm, you know, some alien that no one's ever met before. Like, you don't. There's so much. Cost, you don't know. Like, can, if you don't I look, have a better like, answer. Yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say you listen to a Drupal podcast. <laughs> I just got to emphasize. I want to oh, yeah. own that. Yeah, and I've had that. new <laughs> technologies introduced. Like I was learning mm. Next.js and I'm like, okay, I can browse around, but what's really going on here? And I found a podcast with the founder of Next.js talking about it. Changed mm. my whole perception of everything I read about it, everything I understand. Like if you can get on, if you listen to this podcast or Dries talk about it, you suddenly get this vast understanding of as you're moving yeah. through you're like, oh, there's Drupal. Like, Mike, it's like, that's where you find out there's Drupal.org. It's just an interesting way to learn. I, yeah, I go to podcasts almost immediately. No, no, that's, that's, that's oh. a great, that's, that's, that's a great idea. Yep. If you're listening to this podcast and you're new to the Drupal community, come to a Drupal well, event. That's the next step. Yeah. Welcome and come to a yeah. Drupal event because we would love for you to come and ask questions and get to know the, the great com- people in the community uh, here to support you. And you will very quickly be, if if you come to a Drupal event for the first time and you start talking to people and you say things like, I'm new to the Drupal community. I really want to learn Drupal. I really want to get involved. You will very quickly be directed to the people that you need to, you know, talk to who can actually help make that happen. Of that, I have no doubt. This isn't something that if you're a new graduate will directly help you either. But I think something that in general as a community we've started having this discussion, but if you're in a position to hire or you're in an agency, something that you can start doing is advocating for true entry level jobs in Drupal too. Cause I feel like, especially over the last four or five years when I've heard and from the people that I've worked with, the agencies I've worked with, you know, a lot of them are hiring, you know, mid-level to senior engineers only. They're, they're not hiring people right out of school they're waiting for them to have some sort of experience or they're waiting for them to have some sort of hobby level experience and then bringing them in and kind of getting them up to speed. So, but yeah. I think that's, I think that's an interesting, an interesting point, Nick. I think that you're right on the entry level job openings. And I think a lot of, a lot of companies, agencies want to want somebody to be able to hit the ground running. Right. One thing <laughs> that I saw from a, a Drupal agency, and I'm, I'm not going to provide the name because I'm not hundred percent sure. I remember exactly who I, I heard this from, but they actually worked with um, local uh, universities to develop curriculum mm-hmm. around Drupal and, and be able to create for themselves a pipeline of you know, uh, of candidates and, and, um, you know, they obviously couldn't guarantee everybody got a job, but they had that pipeline of people coming out with the skills that they needed. So like, I would say like, don't even say, don't just go, Hey, we're going to open entry level jobs, but go talk to your local, you know, colleges and universities and say, Hey, could we, could we enhance your, your web curriculum to include like some, some, you know, some learnings about Drupal. So that way we can get people that are qualified and will, you know, will be able to help us do 
you know, what we need to do uh, when they when they come and hopefully work for us. Yeah, I mean, long term, long term, the community needs a large a larger number of junior developers, I think, than it currently has. Um, a significantly larger <laughs> amount of junior developers than it currently has, because those will become our future senior developers, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that's definitely one thing that we can start doing. That's a whole other podcast. A- absolutely. Um, so let, let's uh, let's flip this question over to the other side. So let's say, you know, so we, we just talked about new graduates, no job experience. Let's say you, you already have a career. You're just looking for a change or, or even just maybe a shift. So maybe you're a project manager and you want to become a developer or, you know, you work in a completely different field like mechanical engineering or heat transfer or something, and you want to switch to, to the, the Drupal space, what are kind of the first steps? Um, and Mike, you might be most qualified because I think you're the only one that switched from a previous career. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, whenever I interview someone, um, I am always looking for something in their previous career that they can leverage as a starting point in Drupal. Like, where's that connective tissue? And there's very few careers out there where there is zero connective tissue, right? Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking for um, in folks. And, and then I and then I try to exploit it. You know, if someone has, you know, a strong background in, you know, as a writer, well, then I'm going to exploit that in, you know, making sure that that person, um, you know, you know, is it not maybe not just focused on, but gets plenty of exposure to like Drupal's authoring system and and and, and uh, editorial workflows and things that would appeal to an author. Um, so that's you know, if you have a previous career, that's where I would probably start. Is look for and this you know, it, it usually involves talking to folks, but look for where that connective tissue is. Um, that might give you a leg up initially at least in getting started in Drupal and, you know, something that will, you know, you know about this from this career, but in a Drupal context, that thing, you know, appears in this area. And then that will hopefully ignite your passion for learning about that area in Drupal and therefore learning about more Drupal. So I have a personal experience on that. So I, yeah, I, I didn't come from my art background to Drupal, but I came from, I switched from art to building websites. And the first website I built was my own personal art website. And I think that's an opportunity for a lot of people if they're switching from some career to Drupal to maybe build a site in that, even as a practice exercise or for free. I mean, I can think I built my friend's architecture website for free to start out. Um, and there's little, you know, you can leverage just your past experience with that. Like, it is important to just to build a Drupal site. I do want to emphasize that for everyone in the Drupal community, even if it's a tiny little thing, I think that's a big yeah. step. Even if you're a project manager to be like, I have this hobby and I'm going to just stick a website yeah. up on Pantheon as an example, it makes a huge difference. It's like a hands-on experience. It's like, you got to get your hands dirty a little bit to start that career um, and not be over. And you don't feel overwhelmed with it. You're like, Oh, it just a piece of software. It, I, and I would emphasize that it has to be a real project. It can't just be like, oh, I'm reading this tutorial. I'm going to build this tu- tu- tutorial. And what I mean by real project doesn't mean that it has to be like, like you just mentioned, Jacob, you built something for uh, an architect friend. It doesn't have to be something like that with stakeholders, but it has to be something that you want to manage yourself. Because if you don't have real world questions to answer and solve, you're not going to really, in my experience, you're not going to really embed that knowledge. So for example, you, you could even do something like, I'm going to build a website to catalog my DVD collection or allow mm-hmm. me to sort my DVD collection. Or you know, it doesn't have to be, it can be fairly trivial yeah. what the problem is solving, but it has to be something real that you have to make decisions about because you'll start, to, you'll, you'll make mistakes. And if you're just following the tutorial, like the mistakes that you're going to make are things like, oh, I typed in that command wrong versus oh, I created taxonomies, different vocabularies for every single genre, and now I don't know how to sort on them, and they should just be one vocabulary with, with an hierarchy or something. And, and that, that's part of the learning process. That's part of the experience. Yeah, I think that ties back to passion, right? If you're going to mm-hmm. 
build your first Drupal site, it has to be about something that you have passion in, that you have that you have skin in the game on. That's you know we have an exercise that I give all of our beginner students. Um, it's it happens sometimes around the time when we learn reference fields and how to relate entities to one another. And the exercise is kind of loose. I don't tell them to specifically build this content type and relate it to that content type. Oh, yeah. Uh, I basically say. Take it from a hobby, take it from your current job, take it from, you know, something, but something that you can personally be invested in. And we've had folks build sites on like Magic the Gathering cards and animals and plants and baking and, you know, whatever they're into. Because then when they're adding the content, when they're making these relationships and they're going through the motions because they have expertise or a passion about that topic, they know. They, they can identify where the problems are or where the, you know, where the successes are. Yeah. Magic the Gathering, by the way, is a Drupal site. Or at least it was oh, until a few that's years a good ago. Promo. Wow. I did not know that one. Was Drupal, I know yeah. people that have done magic related or Dungeons and Dragons presentations and things like that in the community, even at DrupalCon. But I didn't know, know that Magic the Gathering was there. Um, so once someone's kind of in the community, what are some of the common hurdles people face when starting a career in Drupal. And I, I'll throw out a word that's important to always own is imposter syndrome. Because I think we've I've suffered from it at one point or another. And it's just important. I think when you openly say that, it makes a big difference to people who are like, oh, yeah, I'm just in a room and I don't feel like I should be here because I don't have anything to contribute, which is just never the truth or the case. But we all have suffered from it at some point in our careers. And just owning that helps. And in Drupal community, we own that. We had I sessions. Will- I will say, it. I will say, Jacob, it's not necessarily, uh, well, at least for me, it's not necessarily feeling like I don't have something con- to contribute. It's sometimes, sometimes I definitely like feel imposter syndrome around like I am not smart enough to be in this room, right? Which is a little self deprecating, but like often, like the imposter syndrome is strong, uh, even, even to this day. Like I feel like, mm-hmm. yep. I, you know, there are way more, there are way smarter people in this room. And like, I don't know that I, I necessarily bring anything to the table. So I, uh, I sympathize with that. At some point in the last 10 years, like a, a switch flipped in my brain about that, where I crave those situations now. I crave mm-hmm. being in a room with, you know, in a room full of people smarter than me, because I know I'm going to learn something. Mm-hmm. And I'm, yeah. I'm comfortable enough in my own skin to, you know, to ask yeah. questions when I don't understand something, but I get that. But I, yeah. I wasn't that way for a long time, and yeah, I don't know I guess, what flipped the switch. But I guess let me clarify. Like I don't, I, I I agree with you on that point. Like I always enjoy being in a room with smarter people. I always think that like I'm always like I it, like everybody in this room is smarter than me, right? Nick's laughing for some reason. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, like, I, I I wish you didn't come. Are out. you talking about this room right now? Is that why Nick's yeah. laughing? <laughs> All right. Um, but like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, imposter syndrome is definitely a a real thing. And like, I think, you know, I think I honestly feel like it's natural, right? If you like, it feels a little bit dangerous to me if you're, you don't have some, some level of imposter syndrome, right? Like if you're like, Oh, I know everything. I'm, I'm the smartest guy in the room. Like that, that sometimes feels dangerous to me, but maybe I'm the only one. I, well, I think the it, Venn diagram of uh, imposter syndrome and humility definitely overlap. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I think part of it too is not, it's not always like, it's not even always like, am I qualified to be here? Sometimes it's like, am I just completely forgetting something super obvious and just making a fool out of myself? Like, for example, the other day, I I asked a question in the Talking Drupal, like the podcast chat about... Um, hook node view wasn't working. And because I just couldn't remember, like I was in a theme, it was in a module. So I was like, oh, it's just going to be hook node view to do it. But I really needed a, a pre-process hook. And I realized it. Um, I think I asked a question to somebody else and they pointed it out. But as soon as they said that, I was like, oh my God. It was like, oh my God, of course, that's what I should be using. And I should know that. And sometimes those types of th- those types of situations also impact uh, <laughs> imposter syndrome, right? It sometimes reinforce that, but, it, but it's not just... Nick's illustrating the point here. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm glad Nick knows that. Cause I'm like, yeah. I didn't know that. Cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but you know, 
But like Mike said, I think that does go back to humility. But I, I think there's another really big hurdle that people face. And that is the learning cliff. I think everybody's seen the XKCD uh, yeah, sure. comic where it, like you're going up, you know, it, it's just like the beginning learning of Drupal is pretty easy, especially on the site building side. Somebody's already installed it. Somebody's got it there. You know, if, if you're not very technical, like entering content in Drupal can be somewhat intimidating because there's a lot of form fields, but you know, with some training, it's, it's pretty straightforward. But if that same person then wants to take the leap to actually working on building their own site in general, you know, over the next six months, they're going to have to learn, you know, Docker and DDEV or Lando. They're gonna to have to learn Git. They're gonna to have to learn Composer. They're gonna to have to learn Config Split. They're gonna to have to learn Drush. They're gonna to have to learn, you know, what version of PHP they need. Server, like, there's a lot of, you know, they're gonna to have to select the host. Like, there's just so much, um, you know, once you've been doing it for a while, there's so much underlying knowledge that you can, you, you just forget that you had to learn at some point. Um, and, and I think that kind of goes back to the mentor again thing again, right? If you don't have a mentor, if you don't have somebody else, you don't even know what you don't know and what you're missing. But if you have a mentor, you can be like, oh my God, I can't figure out why this is, isn't working or something. And, and sometimes it's as simple as, did you remember to import configuration after you pulled down the latest or something? Like they don't, well, maybe well, they don't even, even know what worse, it is. Even worse, you, you don't know if what you know is accurate. Oh. Right, you, like you, you, you think you know stuff, but you don't have the confidence that you know the right stuff. So you can you can do stuff, but always in the back of your mind, I'm like, uh, this this might not be. Oh, cool the, what I'm doing. the one that blows my mind too is the next level of this, Mike. Is I'll be in the Drupal infrastructure channel sometimes, and a couple of people will be talking about something, and then like drum or somebody will just comment and be like, oh yeah, that documentation's wrong. This is the way that it actually works under the hood. It's just like, how do you even know well, that? Yeah. Like, but okay, I'll step back and say that's an exercise in frustration. Programming, I, when I started out, that was my dad, who was an engineer's advice, is like, programming is an exercise in frustration. The question is, can you deal with frustration and can you get around it? Like, like I'm just going to throw that out there. Like, I personally, this is a weird thing to own, but I will not debug an issue for more than 30 minutes. I don't care anymore. If I'm looking hmm. at a problem, I cannot solve it. I just stop and move on to something else. I will literally switch entire gears on a project and not kill a whole day banging my head against the wall because I know it's a waste of time. Because I know if I get a full night's sleep, I will come back in or I'll ask someone. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Drum. <laughs> Neil, I've had yeah. a problem I, on Composer. And I was like, I have no idea. Spent a half hour, threw it in the on Slack. And Neil's like, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> that I got. Oh, that's a known bug. That's a known bug. That yeah, we're that's, a, or, or, that's an issue. But you got to be GitHub prepared. Is gotta, GitHub is yeah, an outage I, or I, something. You, you can't like it. you start getting frustrated. You got to learn how to deal with that and just channel it and, and um, ask for help or know when to move on or work around it or just put a hack in. Sometimes just put a hack in and just be like, I just need to get this to work. I cannot spend okay, more time on it. this. I, I yeah. think that's I think that's actually an interesting so like th those hurdles are hurdles that people come across all the time right so like mm -hmm. not even s career specific right well, like when I when I used to do Drupal um, dev work site building work like you would run into an issue and like you know Jacob's absolutely right you'd bang your head on it for four hours and like Jacob's half an hour seems so much more reasonable. But um, like you bang your head on it and like you'd put it down, you'd go home, you, you know, in the next morning, like nine times out of 10, you'd be taking a shower and you'd be soaping your hair and you'd be like, oh, that's how you solve that one. Right. Um, so I think like that's that's a pretty valuable, um, valuable tidbit there to, to take away. I also think that like one thing and this isn't just when you're starting a career. Right. This is probably throughout your career, right, is a lot of, well, I won't say a lot of, but there are some developers in our in our line of work that bring a lot of ego to development, right, and a lot of, um, um, you know, bravado to, 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 the, to their jobs and, and how they kind of interact with others. And it's funny, I thought about this, Jacob, when you said you've, you've had some bad mentors. Um, um, I, you know, I think that one thing that um, I actually learned from a, a previous boss of mine 
and uh, he was he was responsible for building a team. And, um, you know, that that team kind of had a motto of like, there's no ego. Right. Everybody's here to help everybody else. And like you're not bringing you know, we're not we're not looking for people to bring ego to the team. We're looking for people to bring solutions and, and be, be assistive to each other. So I think that's something that's like can be a hurdle for people. Right. If they're in that scenario of like just starting out and they get into a position where you know, maybe somebody, somebody's bringing a lot of ego to the, to the team. And it's, it's not always, not always helpful. I, I don't think. Mike, I have a uh, kind of a two part question. Maybe we can answer it in one part. Well, I'll let you determine that, but um, we've talked a little bit about Drupal easy uh, throughout the, the podcast. Can you give us like a two second uh, elevator pitch for Drupal easy? And then um, the question here really is what, what are some other resources other than Drupal easy for people to use sure. as they start their Drupal career journey? Sure. Yeah. I'd love to talk about Drupal easy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we've been doing a, uh, beginner class called uh, Drupal career online. I think this is our 12th year now. Uh, wow. run it twice a year, um, in the spring and in the fall, um, generally except somewhere around 10 to 12 students. And it is a very high touch, 12 week, two to three times a week um, course, all online course. Um, our alumni are very active with our current students. Um, the curriculum is all very much best practice uh, focused. Um, and we start from the beginning. We start with you know, getting a local development environment up and running and Composer and Drush and Git and a heavy emphasis on site building and information architecture. Um, we, we dabble in module development and theme development and then developer workflow. Um, so the course, um, it evolves every semester. It's one of those things that's never done. I'll, I'll, I will be rewriting and updating this course you know, until the day that I, I no longer teach it. Um, but we have tremendous success with it. We've, we, um, we have folks who come through the course um, with different goals in mind. Um, and, you know, we try and understand what those goals, goals are ahead of time and, and help them um, achieve those goals. We have a lot of folks coming through the course who already have jobs. Um, maybe they're in a role of, you know, uh, you know a, a, maybe just like a content admin or something like that. And they want to take a larger role. We have folks who are career switchers who want to just become a Drupal contractor. Um, so we help them with their goals. So I know it's more than two seconds, but we're really, we are about, you know, de you know, developing that, that Drupal talent pool and getting folks, you know, up to speed um, and ready for whatever type of Drupal job that they're looking for. Um, we're not the only game in town. It, it definitely, you know, it depends, you know, on the person and how the person learns. Um, you know, we partner with DrupalEyes.me for their screencasts. Um, their screencasts are amazing. You could absolutely, you know, look, start from zero and, and learn how to be a Drupal developer, um, you know, with DrupalEyes.me and some time on, you know, Drupal.org and Slack. But it's not structured. Um, you know, the whole experience wouldn't be structured. And um, that's not for everybody. Um, there are other training organizations out there with courses that are, either somewhat similar or not very similar to ours. Um, there are piecemeal courses. You can go to like different Drupal events. I'll be teaching at Drupal Camp New Jersey here. I don't know when this podcast is released, so maybe it already happened, but day-long courses here and there are Drupal events um, that you can take. Um, there's still Drupal books out there. Um, I, I don't know how, you know, back in the day in Drupal four, five, six, seven days, it was, a, it was more of a thing. Um, there's not nearly as many Drupal books out there uh, today, but there's still, there's plenty of learning resources. Um, but I, I normally ask our potential students, you know, about how they want to learn, how they learn best and, and help them, you know, uh, find what they're looking for that way. I think I answered both questions there, right? Oh yeah. You started yeah. answering other questions too. I mean, oh, did I? The, oh, okay. it's good. I, I mean, I think the training, <laughs> what we missed, and I want to emphasize like those, yeah. The, there's local Drupal camps all over the world and they yeah. have training days. And those things are, those are amazing ways to get a small but intense dosage of some aspect of Drupal where you can learn a lot. 
Um, and I think that for me, those I've done one or two of those and they've been huge. Like on theming, I think that's where I learned the fundamentals of theming in a four hour training session. And the great part about that is often, not all the time, but often you are getting it from the original source material, right? Yeah. Like you are getting trained in, I'll use you as an example, Jacob, you know, get trained using web form by Jacob, right? Yeah. That is invaluable. Oh yeah. Um, it's well, also no, that's it's other also, ones like yours, though. But well, I think also, it, no, but oh. Go ahead. I was just gonna say yeah. it's also sometimes um, you know real world experience too, right? So like you can learn web forms from Jacob, but like sometimes you have you know you have folks doing uh, doing trainings based on kind of like real world implementations that they've done or uh, case studies, right? So it's like it gives you a little bit more of that real world experience, I think, as well. I, I was going to point out, yeah, that one other thing when people come into the Drupal community to understand that each aspect of Drupal is written by people and you can actually find those. So you can find me about web forms, but I got to emphasize with theming, like John Alvin Wilkins, right? He is one of the best presenters in the world. And basically everything I know about theming usually comes from his presentations. Even if I want to know what's next, I like to catch him at DrupalCon and just see what he's, what he's thinking is important. I mean, like, yeah, Tailwind CSS was like, three years before people started talking about it, he had just did a presentation. So yeah, I think understanding that besides the code, there's people. I mean, literally in Drupal core, there's a maintainers.txt file that lists all these people that do, all of them are at different conferences talking about these different- And the apps. vast majority are extremely approachable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'll do this next question. And I, I wanna see who posed it. It's what's the value of starting a career in the Drupal community? Because I think we've been circling around how important we all think it's valuable to have a career in the Drupal community. I, I, uh, we, we still get paid it. extremely well. I mean, yeah. that's why people have jobs. To yeah. you know, most people have jobs to get paid, and compared to a lot of other web development positions, you know, people who have experience with Drupal get paid quite well. Yeah. You know, and I'll add something is stability. Like Drupal is yeah. kind of here to stay. People might say no but i i know plenty of people like i knew someone was like i'm learning ruby and five years ago he was all into it now he's like wait i'm done and moved on to like dot net and in the drupal community people have been around for 10 15 years yeah. and it's here to stay i mean the, the roles change and i think we do want to own that but and and i think drupal changes right and i think that's why it's it's still around right it is um, it's always evolving, right. And, and adapting to what, you know, current market trends are, are requesting of it. And, you know, I think, you know, I think you're right, you know, Jacob, I think the value in starting a career in Drupal is that you can, you can have a, a, you know, a long fruitful Drupal career and, and hit on a bunch of different positions throughout that career, right? From, from, you know, entry position Drupal developer to, you know, Drupal consultant um, and throughout that career and, 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 you know, be able to, you know, be able to grow almost, almost with Drupal, right? Because I remember, you know, when I started my career, it was like Drupal, you know, four, seven, and it was like, you know, headless was not even a thing. And like, you know, the, the, there was, we were still using, uh, what, uh, PHP templates for, for front end Drupal. Right. So like, Oof. yeah. <laughs> so like yeah, things, things are changing and, and Drupal is changing with them, which is, uh, which is nice, I think. Yeah. Oh, th there's a couple of the quick things too, for that. One is the community, right? If you're good at what you right. do and you're part of the community and you do lose your job, there's, there's a net like the community you can you have you can get a lot of contacts and you and the community is as broad it is as it is it's pretty tight knit and so people can try to help you find you know find a place um so and that kind of goes to your point jacob you know stability it's not just stability because drupal is going to be around for a long time but it's also stability for yourself like if you're if you're changing or just looking for a change even if you don't just lose your job if you're just looking for a change there's there's a lot out there. So, so how do people find jobs in the Drupal community? Um, if they're looking. I mean, 
I don't know. The, I guess the typical ways that you one would find a job, right? Job boards, recruiters, word of mouth, um, Drupal.org. I don't know um, if you know you guys know, but there is there are jobs posted to Drupal.org. I think the most reliable way, for especially for people new to Drupal, is through networking. You know, jobs.drupal.org makes me a little bit crazy when I go on there and, and read some of those job postings. Um, well, let's, let's be honest. It makes me a lot crazy um, because a lot of them are just so poorly written and, you know, everyone is asking for the moon. Um, and a lot of them is just not realistic. Um, recruiters. Um, that's a close second in things that make me crazy in the Drupal <laughs> job world. Um, yeah. Because often the recruiters they don't know Drupal. They don't know exactly what their client is looking for. And, and, and most of them don't do a very good job in learning how to, you know, transfer that information from what the client actually needs to who they're going after. Um, I think word of mouth and networking are the way to go, um, which is why I think getting involved in the community um, uh, having a mentor, all that stuff is so important because when it comes down to it, that's, you know, I also think it's probably the easiest way to get a job, you know, and I'm not saying that it's exclusively how you're going to get a job, but I think if you have a, a, a Drupal network, you're more likely to get a job from your network than you are from jobs.drupal.org. So well, 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 it's not, it's not, yeah. it's not the fault of the website. It's the fault of the people posting their their, their yeah. job ads. Look, can I can I give a caveat there? Because I agree with you about jobs. Like those listings to throw me off. But one thing about I I wrote out the mark Drupal's marketplace. Like there's a page on Drupal where it's like a who's who of the Drupal community. And for someone new to the Drupal community, it is kind of there's a lot of value to go through that top ten or top twenty list and be like understand what Aquia is. Like Aquia is the biggest. Drupal shop there, like the Red Hat to Drupal, and they offer all those jobs. And you can go to their website and look at their jobs. And then you can move down the rung and see other smaller shops and see each one of those shops has their jobs posted on their website. And it gives you a good idea of what the opportunities are or when they're open. And but yeah, still, but, John, it's still networking is a key thing. It's just, but to understand what's available. But may, and maybe this isn't like a Drupal industry specific thing. Yeah. But I think most job listings are very intimidating. Because I think the folks who write a lot of job listings um, sometimes get uh, the must-haves and the nice-to-haves conflated. And when you start putting, you know, you know, 38 acronyms on there for someone who's new to Drupal and they see that, they're like, oh, I'm never going to, you know, going to get that this job because I don't know half these things. When, it, it, but then when you talk to Drupal, especially Drupal agencies, you know, what do they say that they hire for the most? And it's not that I'm accusing them of not being truthful. I think they're actually absolutely being truthful. They're hiring for culture fits, right? Because you can train someone to learn more Drupal a lot easier than you can train someone to, to mesh with the company culture. Yeah. So, so I think there's this I, huge disconnect between what agencies are actually looking for and what they put in their job postings. And so it makes I will, me, sorry, I will I'm, say I mute myself. No, no, you're fine. You're <laughs> fine. I, I sympathize with your with your aggravation. And I will say um, that you're both right. I uh, the position I'm in right now, I got by, um, you know, word of mouth by a referral from somebody I know from the community. Right. And um, I worked with a recruiter for the company that I work for. EPAM has their own team of recruiters. Um, we had a conversation. He wasn't necessarily a Drupal guy, but he had a good idea what was going on. Right. And what he, what the, the, you know, the hiring manager needed. Right. Um, I did look at the job description and was like, yeah, okay, I can do most of this stuff. So I, you know, I think, if you're hearing anything from our show today, like it's definitely that experience may vary. Um, but I do agree with Mike Anello in the fact that um, word of mouth and um, your network are very, very helpful when not only, you know, starting a Drupal job, uh, maintaining a Drupal job, building, growing um, a Drupal job. 
Uh, so jumping into our next question here, um, you know, what do people do to build, maintain and grow their Drupal careers? You know, I think one thing is like building a, a network, right? Building a network of people and, um, you know, definitely, definitely, uh, keeping, keeping, um, tabs on, on that network and, and what they're, what they're doing, how, what they're into. Um, but you know, there are other things like training certifications, conferences is a big one for me. Like I think attending conferences is like your two birds, one stone sort of scenario there, right? You're doing your networking, you're meeting new people, finding out about new, new, uh, organizations and positions, but also, um, can learn new, new things, new skills. Uh, what are some other ones that, that you guys are, are thinking of as far as like ways to kind of grow your career? I mean, a big one is once you're in it, you're, you're, you know, assuming you're in it because you're trying to grow it, right? Looking for challenges, right? And look for um, things where you can expand knowledge that you didn't have before. You know, if you're, if you've mostly been mm -hmm. a back end developer, maybe find a small part of front end stuff that you can do. Even if it's, you're not going to switch your career path into that, sometimes understanding, um, a different aspect of it is is helpful because you can just speak more knowledgeably um, when you're talking to a project manager about how long something will take because you you've done some of it right. Um, there's you know th there's one thing just look for challenges look for things that you haven't done before. Mike, you got something to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with Nick Nick's answer, of course. I mean, you know, you gotta you gotta find something that that keeps your passion alive, right? If you're a problem solver, you got to find new problems to solve. Um, and, and I think, you know, specifically the question is to build, maintain, and grow your Drupal career. So you have to learn new things, right, in order to 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 evolve into a, a larger role or a different role. Um, and I would say the you know one of the easiest ways to do that is to find the analog in the Drupal community for what you want to learn. Right? If you want to take more of a project leadership role in your team, in your, your work team, then take more of a project leadership role in something in the community and demonstrate that you have those skills or use the community to learn and, and hone those skills. I think one thing to highlight there is that it's not going to happen overnight, right? So like it's going to take time. And you're going to have to build those relationships and build those skills. Right. So like, if you're looking for like immediate growth, that like, that's, that's something that you gotta, you kind of have to reset your expectations there. Um, you know, again, I go back to like building your network. I think like every, every job I've ever, I've ever gotten or every, uh, you know, every, uh, career shift I've ever made has been, you know, pretty closely tied to my network and, and knowing, knowing somebody or knowing, knowing a company or, uh, or seeing a need within, within that company. So. Um, right. Yeah. You got to put your time in on that. That's, that's a, that's a big one. Put your time in on growing your network, make personal connections. Uh, yeah. I, the next question kind of leads to that. Cause I'll throw out there. Like I, I, um, the question that we're going to, Explorers, like, what are some recommendations for building and maintaining your Drupal resume, which is different than your network? Network, network is the people you know. And I would mm -hmm. throw out resume is the, for lack of a better word, the persona or online presence that you have to describe your skill set or your career. And I think resume is no longer just a piece of paper or even your LinkedIn profile, especially mm -hmm. in the Drupal world. People type your name and you appear in search results. And Everything there is your resume at this point, including the photo, hopefully not of a fraternity party doing something totally inappropriate in Google's images. And I, I think it's a good discussion to point out to people. I mean, personally, I've invested a lot in that in my career because I felt like I was going, no, if I had a point where I was like, what's my next job? Where do I go? Am I going to be able to sit across from someone and explain that to them? And I was like, no, the better way to do it is take control of that dialogue and put a lot online. Like one of the reasons I have so many videos on YouTube is people hear me talk before they ever meet me for a job interview. They're mm -hmm. obviously going to see that and be like, that's an approachable person. And I've just put that out there. Um, what are some other ways like for building that profile that people can think of or that people do personally? I mean, I'm saying I definitely like recording YouTube videos. I, I just find it easy 
and makes me very approachable to people. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, like as a, as a hire somebody hiring, like I, like I said before, I'm always looking at that Drupal.org profile, like make sure that thing is up to date, especially if you're going for a Drupal job, like make sure thing that thing's up to date, make sure it shows that you're like, you're active and engaged in the community. Um, one other thing that, you know, Jacob actually just sparked for me as far as, um, as far as like places people look right. Like when doing a Google search, um, like if you're like guest posting on blogs, like, uh, our, our friend, Amy June, right. Uh, open source.com. Like, you know, if you, if you have articles on there, right. Like those are, those are definitely great, um, great things to highlight either on your resume or, um, through your various profiles and social media, just because like, you know, if you're, if somebody's looking into you as far as like what you're doing and they see posts there or, or, you know, Drupal, a good Drupal.org profile, like that's, that's like half the battle in my opinion. I, I think writing is key. I think, you know, not being, you know, not just being able to write, but enjoying writing and putting your, your writing out there because in a Drupal job, arguably the majority of your communication with your coworkers is going to be through writing through issue queues, project yeah. trackers, Slack. So um, having, you know, being comfortable in, with, in that communication context, I think, and, and being able to express yourself um, well and clearly and concisely, hmm. um, which is all great traits for participating in Drupal issue queue, right? All the same mm -hmm. traits, clear, concise, that's a huge, that, that is, you know, that's part of like a culture fit almost. I think, you know, it's kind of a technical skill as well. Um, but I think that yeah. goes a long way. And to clarify a little bit there from my position, like I'm not saying like you need to be on opensource.com. Like you could have your own blog. You could be writing, you know, you could be writing posts somewhere else. Like, and as somebody who doesn't really love to write, they don't even really have to be like full length, in my opinion, full length, like blog posts, right? Like how to's even video, like videos on YouTube where you're explaining a process or how to do something like, um, Jacob knows all about those. He's got some of the, the greatest web form videos out there. Right. Um, like, I think those are like a, a great marketing tool to show people that you can like explain a process. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just mm -hmm. going to add to that is just to like the example would be if you put code on drupal.org spend time on the project page and i want to emphasize when i say that write out a good description with some passion if you are uncomfortable writing a description you write one sentence and then record a video and link to the video but you want to put besides just putting code out there you put yourself out there a little bit it helps by the way it makes people feel more approachable to your project to begin with if it yeah. if there's a page that says hey this is what it does this is how you get help post questions. We're here to help. You know, it makes a huge difference and I, it helps with a career too. People want to see that, that you're approachable and it makes you, yeah, being approachable, I think makes a huge difference. Nick, what were you going to add? I, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, the thing is you basically just have to find a way to communicate <laughs> with people. Right. Um, and another good way in the Drupal community, that's a little bit unique. I mean, other communities have this, but you can help organize a camp or go to a camp. In, you know, and or give a talk at a camp or a DrupalCon or something like that will expose some of the stuff uh, that you have to say to people. Uh, go to local meetups. It's a great way to build your network. And if you give a little talk at a meetup, you can put something online. I don't know if it's up anymore, but I think um, one of the first thing I, I spoke at a Drupal Nights, which was a, a local Boston thing at one point. You know, things like that they can help. They can help let people know um, what your thoughts on are on things. Or, you know, if you have something to say, you can always uh, let us know. That if you have something to share, you could join us here. Um, yeah. This might be a good way to uh, get yourself. We're, right we're gonna do a, we're gonna do open mic night here at Talking Drupal. <laughs> um, okay, so as we as we bring this show to a close, I want to go around the table again here the hypothetical table um, and uh, have everybody give like, like your, your best piece of advice, not that you haven't already, but like your best piece of advice for somebody starting a Drupal career. Like what is, if you had one thing to say to somebody, what would it be? Mike Anello, I'm going to put you on the hot seat and let you go first. It, it, it's all about people. You have to, you know, communicate, get involved, network with people. 
that's the, you know, that will, in my experience and seeing and shepherding hundreds of people through the process, nothing accelerates the process more than good networking. And Jacob, what about you? I, 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 of course, I think we're all going to agree with Mike, but I, I'll just say from my insight, it's, it's also being realizing that you have to have some online presence, like when you're networking and like you have to have that Drupal.org profile or you have to have that code out there and you should put something out there and take that risk and put yourself in that just uncomfortable zone a little bit. But it really helps. It helps with networking. I can't say like I've been talking to people and I'm like, oh, I wrote a blog post about that. And then that helps the dialogue or even in a job interview situation. So I think it's important to put yourself out there, put some content out there. Um, it makes a big difference in your career. And gradually, as you build your career, you get more comfortable with it. Nick Laughlin, what about you? I have three things very quick. Number one, find your local meetup and go there. Number two, join Drupal Slack and find some community initiative, whether it's accessibility or something like that. Join that specific group, start participating. And number three, listen to Talking Drupal. But no, if join the Drupal Slack community because even if there's not an in-person community near you, um, that's a great way to start to get to know people and and get involved. That's a, that's, those are all very um, yeah. great points. I think the one thing that I would add here is like, you know, everybody brings value, right? Going back to that kind of like, I, I strong be I believe strongly in, you know, non-code contributions, but I think everybody brings value. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, a couple of different, entry points into Drupal, right? You could be starting, at, you know, shifting from another career. You could be coming right out of college. Um, you could be looking for a new something new and just starting Drupal. I think everybody's got something to bring to the table. And, you know, I think the community, um, the Drupal community supports that. You know, if you have a, a viewpoint, like nine times out of 10, there are going to be um, people that share that viewpoint and that can help you, um, foster and grow that, that viewpoint, that, that product, that thing. So, um, I definitely think that, um, you know, we, we try to be inclusive of everyone. And I think that that's, that's important, especially when you're starting, you know, starting a, a career in a, in a new piece of, uh, a p new piece of software or a new, new community. All right. We have come to the end of our show. Mike Anello, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me once again. Appreciate it. And thank you, Jacob, for joining us for the last four weeks. It's been, been a pleasure. Thank you Man, so I, much. This I was, was definitely going to get to that later on, but that's all right. Ah, but we could, I just want it's just a great, been a great experience. It's kind of like nice to do this for four weeks is to have that kind of weekly discussion. It's huge. Yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity. No problem. For our listeners, if you have questions or feedback, you can reach out to talk. Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or by email with show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on the Drupal Slack and the Talking Drupal channel. You can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more at talkingdrupal.com slash TD promo. You can get the Talking Drupal newsletter for show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and much more. You can sign up for the newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at TalkingDrupal.com and hitting the Become a Patron button in the sidebar. Okay, we've gotten to the shameless self-promotion section of our show. So, Mike Adello, if folks wanted to reach out to you, learn more about Drupal Easy, how could they do it? Uh, so I'm Ultimike, pretty much everywhere, UI. U-L-T-I-M-I-K-E. Um, on Mastodon as well, ultimike at uh, drupal.community. I'm on li LinkedIn, pretty easy to find there. I tend to, um, I post equally on all three, on, on Twitter, uh, Mastodon, and LinkedIn. So just follow me in one place if you want to follow me. And I tend to post almost every day something Drupal-y. Um, and then drupaleasy.com if you're interested in either our beginner class or we now have a professional module development class that is 15 weeks long and 90 hours of curriculum, which is so much fun to teach. I actually just got done teaching it about a half hour before we um, we adjourned, we, we, we started today and it, I, it's, I absolutely love it. 
I, I love the fact that you're an equal opportunity poster. We appreciate that about you. So, um, well, I made that switch as you, you know, may have may have surmised a couple of months ago when things started going. You know, some more variables were entered into the system. There you the go, social media system. <laughs> Jacob, uh, again, thank you for joining us for the last four weeks. If somebody wanted to reach out to you, uh, how could they do it? Uh, I'm Jay Rockwitz everywhere, Twitter, Drupal.org. My site's jrockwitz.com, LinkedIn, same thing. And yeah, you can catch me on the Slack channel. Drupal Slack is Jay Rockwitz. And Nick Laughlin for the 391st time. Wow. For those people that have gone through and listened to all the episodes at this point, where can folks find you? I will point out that it actually is 391 because while we did have a 000 episode, we did skip one episode. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a long lost missing triple episode. Uh, but listeners can find me at Nixvan, N I C X B A N, pretty much everywhere. And I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on all the major social networks and Drupal.org at John Picozzi. And uh, if you want to learn about EPAM uh, or careers at EPAM, you can go to epam.com or epam.com slash careers. Okay, so I get to wrap this up. So if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>